So 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. First off, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. All right, now that sounds very simple, but let's look at it, because it is simple, but we're going to look at the words. Whosoever shall confess. Now see, that word confess doesn't mean just say. To confess means to say and have corresponding action. So it, right here, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. See, we have to realize just saying Lord, Lord doesn't get you saved. Jesus said that himself, isn't that right? So just confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, anybody could confess that and it not be a salvation type confession. Why? Because the devil will confess that Jesus is God is, is the Son of God. Why? Because it's a fact. And he can confess that, but his life doesn't match it. Does that make sense? In other words, your confession has to match your lifestyle. Let me give you another aspect of it. If you're going to confess that according to the word of God, by his stripes you were healed, then you have to act healed. Right? If you keep acting sick, the actions don't match your confession. Does that make sense? Okay. You say, well, yeah, but I'm too sick to do that. I'm not saying you have to act perfectly. I'm saying you have to do whatever you can do to act well. Right? Now, whosoever shall confess, that means say and live accordingly, that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Verse 16. Now, listen to this. These are points. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Now, notice, he that dwells in love. What does it mean to dwell in love? It doesn't mean to walk around saying, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Why? Because as I quoted in the earlier session, it's not a matter of just what you say. Your life has to match it. Right? Just like we just used the word confess right here. And so you have to realize that for love to be love, there has to be not just words, but there has to be an action matching that love. If the words say one thing, but your actions say something else, then number one, you're either double minded or, which would still be double minded to a degree, you're just lying. Pretty simple, right? So, because a lot of people say, well, I love this person, love that person. Okay, then what are you doing with them, to them? You know, how are you treating them? Because why? Jesus made it very clear that we're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Now, then he said, because they had a question about how do we do that? And his, his answer was very simple. Do to them what you would want done to you. Notice the operative words there. Do. Not think. Not say, do. Actions count louder than words in most cases. Amen? Now, he says, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Now, that statement right there is the reason for basically every Christian failure. Every Christian failure in faith or in any area goes back to not knowing and believing God's love for us. Why? Because our faith is in God because of his love for us. So if you don't believe that, and and not just believe, but known, we've known and believed the love that God has to us. If we don't have that, then we will have a failure because there will be doubts, there will be things come up, there will be, well, maybe he's doing this. And now the enemy has gotten smart enough to even twist it, to say, well, God's doing this because he loves you. You know, He's not going to heal your leg because he loves you so much because he knows if he healed your leg, you might be tempted to go to a club and dance. I've heard that. Right? And so the enemy twists now of why he won't heal. But, see, God doesn't do things to make you not sin. If he did that for you, he'd have to do it for everybody because he's not a respecter of persons. So every dancer should have broke legs. 
Amen? Does that make sense? So we have to realize that what the enemy will do is he will take the goodness of God and try to twist it in a way that we, we negate it. We, we still believe in it, but we negate it. Now, in verse 17, now watch this. He says, well, verse 16, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein, now notice, herein, in this, is our love made perfect. In what? In the fact that we have known and believed his love and we dwell in him. That makes sense? And because of that, because we have known and believed the love he has toward us, our love is made perfect. Why? Because we see what kind of love he has toward us. Now, notice, in this is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, notice he said we're going to have boldness in the day of judgment. But it also tells us that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can obtain help and mercy in a time of need. Notice how you come to the throne of grace? Boldly. Now, the word boldly means freedom to speak or the ability to speak freely. So, in other words, you don't come crawling in. Oh, um, uh, I, I'm so sorry, God, I, that I, I don't want to bother you. No, that's not the way you come to God. Now, today we're going to, cut, we're going to talk a little bit about how to come to God and since God is the judge, okay, then you come to him almost like a lawyer, right? Meaning you have to have precedent and case history. Amen? And when you come, you come and you come with the law on the books. And you state precedent. You can state the law. You can state the precedent. And you can state even case history where you can show God that you know what his will is so that you can obtain what you need and prove that what you need is the will of God. 